I want to share with you um, some of the information that's out there now, and there's a lot more information than there ever was on stress and how society is managing stress and what the different stress um, components are. And then specifically, I wanted to talk about all of the knowledge that we now have about how yoga has an impact on stress. So I thought I'd start by first talking about stress and its characteristics um, and go through a number of slides just to give you sort of a broad perspective of what we know about stress and its characteristics and then move on to the psychophysiological effects of, of, of yoga and how that fits with, with the whole idea of chronic stress. So let's first talk about the characteristics and consequences of, of stress itself. And of course, stress is a big word in society now. It's a cover of Time magazine uh, with a sh scary cover. Um, it's very well known. Stress is very well known. Everybody talks about it. And everybody talks about how to manage it. And uh, in fact, the American Psychological Association has made a major effort in um, following stress in America. For example, they have the Stress in America survey, and they've conducted this survey every year uh, since 2007 all the way to 2015, providing information about you know, how Americans are stressed and why they're stressed, uh, and, and providing also information on uh, how people can deal with stress. So in their survey in 2015, um, they concluded that since 2007, the survey has found that money and work are consistently the top two sources of significant stress, 67% and 65%. This year, for the first time, the survey found that family responsibilities were the third most common stressor at 54%, followed by personal health concerns, health problems affecting their family, and the economy. And these are all in the 50s in terms of percentage. While average uh, reported stress levels in the United States have increased slightly in the past two years, adults are more likely than in, than in past years to report experiencing extreme stress, and that's eight or nine or 10 on a scale of 10. 24% of adults report these levels. So that's, that's huge. 24% of the population is, is reporting extreme stress. Um, and this represents the highest percentage reporting extreme uh, stress since 2010. So it's still a problem in society, and it, it, if anything, it may be growing. But before we talk about stress, let's make some definitions. Stress is basically, psychological stress is basically a challenge. It can be either positive or negative, and it can be short-term, acute, or it can be long-term or chronic. Um, we're very familiar with stressors. Some of the more serious stressors are the death of a loved one, a close relation, violence, war, poverty, unemployment. Um, moving is a big stressor. Uh, having a court case or a divorce is very stressful. And then there are very small stressors that we deal with every day, things like exams, uh, red tape, uh, commuting in, in traffic, and so on. Um, but there are positive stressors in our lives because stress not only comes at us from a negative side, we also have positive excitement and so on from stressors. So if we're getting married, if we inherit a lot of money, if you have a birth of a child uh, or a promotion at work, although these are positive events, they do come with actually a stress response in your body, but it's actually a good stress response for you. Now, the key about stress is, is how you deal with it. The stressor is just a stressor. A situation is just a situation. The question is, how do you interact with it? And the key thing is to whether you experience a stress positively or negatively or is your sense of control or manageability of that stressor. Um, the other thing is that stressors don't necessarily just come at you from the outside. We have internal stressors, our own guidelines, our own limitations, our own restrictions that can cause stress for us given the circumstances that we're in uh, at any time in, in life. So um, one of the things is, is that uh, stressors can lead to positive or negative outcomes. So positive stress um, can add anticipation or excitement. Uh, so obviously, adolescents playing video games, it's a stressful thing, but it's exciting. Um, and so that's a positive enhancement of stress. Negative stress, on the other hand, can lead to irritability, anxiety, depression, a number of mood disorders. Um, and if sustained over the long term, this is the problem with chronic or repetitive stress, uh, it can lead to burnout or distress or the negative consequences of stress, which is what most people are talking about these days. So there's a wide variety of psychophysiological consequences and symptoms of people who are under chronic stress. In other words, they're not able to manage the stress in their lives and they're 
uh, they're paying a price for all of that stress and they're not able to cope with it. And one of the most important components is really mood impairment and mood disorders. And this includes anxiety and depression are the two big ones, but it can also lead to cognitive impairment like concentration problems. And then these symptoms can manifest in a variety of different ways in different individuals. So a lot of people will actually manifest in musculoskeletal pain and, and tension, back aches, neck aches, that kind of thing. Um, uh, cardiorespiratory symptoms like shortness of breath or, or palpitations of the heart. Uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, a lot of people will have indigestion or digestive problems. Uh, insomnia is very common, um, as well as even skin problems uh, can manifest with people who are under chronic stress. Um, finally, there's also dysfunctional behaviors that can manifest in chronic stress. People can have appetite changes or uh, start engaging in substance abuse, drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes to try and cope with their stress. Um, and they can also withdraw from society, and, and that can be a negative uh, outcome as well. So one of the things that's important to know about stress, another factor that many people don't realize, it's really in the eye of the beholder. It's very inter-individual. Uh, and not only that, but it can change over time. One person's stressor, in a, is an, a negative stressor, is another person's positive stressor. And it really varies from individual to individual. And of course, it also varies over time. So what you might think is a stressor when you're 20 years old, you might not think is a stressor when you're 50 years old and vice versa. So this whole perception of what is a stress is a key player in the stress response. Um, and that's what we're really talking about when we talk about the consequences of stress is the stress response. And we have two stress systems that, that work together essentially to, to create the stress response. It's also called the fight or flight response. Um, and it's become studied to the degree that now we can, you know, there's a whole field of stress research. Um, so this is a paper that's published in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine by a leader in the field of stress research, you know, outlining the characteristics of how stress works. It all starts with perceived stress, your perception of a threat uh, and a sense of helplessness, and this can come from major life events or trauma or abuse or environmental stressors. And that leads to a physiologic response. That physiologic response is essentially um, the fight or flight response. Uh, and the two stress systems, one of them is the autonomic nervous system, which manifests as sympathetic innervation, and the stress hormone noradrenaline. And the other stress system is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but the bottom line there is the stress hormone cortisol. So you have these two stress hormones and the sympathetic innervation of many different aspects in your body. So that physiologic response is dependent upon individual differences, um, and it's also dependent upon behavioral responses, how you're coping with that stress to, to, to see that outcome. Now, in an ideal situation, you are confronted with a stressor, um, you go through the stress response, and then you recover. And that's called allostasis, the, the, the fact that we're adapting successfully uh, to this stressor. However, if you don't adapt to the stressors in your life and these things build up, we end up what's called, we end up with what's called allostatic load. Uh, and that's the problem we face with, with um, high levels of stress hormone and high sympathetic innervation. And that's diagrammed here. Um, in this wonderful drawing uh, uh, of someone undergoing a severe uh, emotional reaction. And what's pictured here is all the areas of the brain that are interacting. And look at all the arrows going to all the different areas of the body. All of the internal organs are innervated virtually by sympathetic innervation. And then in addition to that, you've got all these stress hormones coursing through the blood, affecting all of the organs in the body as well. So this is a global response. Uh, and that's why stress problems can manifest in so many different ways, in the, in the skin, in the muscles, et cetera, et cetera, because the stress response really has impact across the entire body. So um, finally, um, this, this, the, the major issue that we're really talking about here is, is unmanaged and chronic stress. So how does this work? How do we reach this point where we're no longer managing um, stress and it's no longer a functional uh, response? Well, this is, um, again, from the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is diagramming here on the top what happens in a typical stress response. So you're driving in your car, and you're coming to an intersection. The light is green, and then suddenly a car comes and runs the red light right in front of you, and you slam on the brakes, and you come within a couple of inches of hitting that car. 
Well, and you know what happens when that happens to you. You suddenly, your heart is beating very rapidly. You're sweating. You're, you know, you're undergoing a full-blown stress response and an appropriate stress response. So this is what happens here. The stress occurs at the beginning, and then the physiologic responses, which is that stress hormone, the heart beating, and all that stuff goes up dramatically. Now, a few minutes later, or you know, an hour later, you're driving in your car, and suddenly you've calmed down. And of course, there's a recovery period after that stressor. So this is the normal stress response. This is the fight or flight response. And this is an endogenous characteristic of virtually all animals. We, this is a survival mechanism. So when you're walking in the woods, you meet the proverbial bear in the woods. The first thing that happens is that you have to interpret what that is. Is this a stuffed bear? And, f and poses no threat, or is, it there, is this a, a tamed bear with a trainer on a leash, etc., or is this a real bear that could really kill you? So that's the first uh, determination. Is this a threat? Is this a true threat? If the answer in your executive brain is yes, suddenly a whole cascade of systems comes into play. Those, those stress systems get activated. And they activate the appropriate areas. So you get more muscle blood, you get more blood flow to the muscles so that you can run or fight. You have more blood flow to the brain so that your senses are more acute. Your digestive system shuts down altogether because you don't need to worry about digestion when you're in a fight or flight mode. So all of that, all of that works and, and that's, that's fine. And the problem is, in modern society, we don't meet many bears, but we do have a lot of individual stressors and they come at us pretty fast. So this is a situation more like modern society where you get up in the morning and suddenly you notice that uh, you're, you're getting up late and then you have an argument with your spouse and then your car won't start and then you get in a traffic jam and then you're late for work and your boss chews you out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see that in a normal situation, yes, you would ideally recover from all of those stressors. But, you know, that takes a toll on you. And, to, and for some people, actually, it starts to build. So these things, you don't get recovery. And so suddenly you end up in this situation where the whole stress system is turned on in a chronic way. You have chronic unmanaged stress and it's unremitting. So now you're stuck with this. Um, and the issue is, how do you get, how do you get out of this? Um, and many people, unfortunately, don't know how to deal with stress. Actually, the majority of society no doesn't know how to deal with stress because we're not taught how to deal with stress in our schools. Our schools have no systems or, or no teaching as to how to cope with stress and strong emotion. So as a society, we lack the skills of coping with chronic stress, despite the fact that a quarter of the population is experiencing extreme stress. So now you can imagine what that's causing in terms of, of mental health burden and, and disease burden because this chronic stress is a strong risk factor for developing disease states. So if anything, we respond to stress typically dysfunctionally. It's, it's, it's paradoxical, but a lot of people will respond to stress in, 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 a, in a way that doesn't help them. So this cartoon reads, I'm not eating, I'm self-medicating. And uh, she's eating a full tub of ice cream. Um, and of course, eating junk food um, and smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol are not functional. They're not helping you cope with the stress. If anything, they're impairing your nutrition, um, they're impairing your health to actually complicate the situation further. So what we really need is, is, is adequate and, and proper stress management strategies. Um, and so these maladaptive behaviors can include stimulants, poor nutrition, and e people will even sleep deprive themselves. And of course, uh, I'm in the division of sleep medicine, and, and we're very much aware of how sleep deprivation can really impair your functioning, not just cognitive functioning, but all of the systems of the body are, are impaired. So many people are actually not only under chronic stress, but they're exhibiting these maladaptive behaviors to stress. Now, there are some conventional stress measures. One of those stress measures is simply recognize that you've taken on too much, and reduce that stress. So take on less, you know, don't take on that extra part-time job to earn that extra money, and just do that. The problem is that in modern society, a lot of people don't have the luxury of being able to remove the stress. If you're in poverty, um, if you're in a war zone, you can't change those circumstances. Um, another example is this cartoon here, which says, your mother and I are feeling overwhelmed, so you'll have to bring yourselves up. Parenthood. If you're a parent, you have to be a parent. There's no option. You can't just, you know, farm them out. So um, 
you are stuck. You have to cope with the stress of, of parenthood as well as the cope of, uh, of the stress of, you know, providing for the family and, and, and so on. So um, this is where um, we come into a new concept, and that concept is the concept of stress tolerance and resilience. And the idea of resilience is that you bounce back from a stressor more effectively, and, this, and the idea of tolerance is that you can manage higher levels of stress. Now, just like stress is malleable, so is stress tolerance and resilience. In other words, you can change your stress tolerance and resilience. And I think one of the key ways to be able to do that is yoga. So this brings us to the psychophysiology of yoga and how that can impact in terms of um, uh, managing stress. So let me give you a little bit of the history um, and, and the breadth of what we know about uh, yoga and, and how it works. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of research now that, that's looking at this. Um, and this is a quote from uh, my teacher, Yogi Bhajan. And he said, yoga teaches you the techniques and awareness to stay healthy. You gain strong immune, glandular, and nervous systems. This foundation gives you energy and lets you deal with the mental and spiritual facets of your life. And this is actually a fairly modern definition of yoga. It's one that the general public generally uses. And the whole idea is that uh, they're coming to yoga practice in droves because it gives them functionality. It allows them to cope with life effectively. And the research that we have now um, looking at basic research effects on, on yoga is now growing substantially. So now there are actually review papers summarizing uh, what we know about the science of how yoga works. Um, this paper up at the top, How Does Yoga Reduce Stress? A Systematic Review of Mechanisms of Change and Guide to Future Inquiry. Um, and uh, another one here looking at the neurophysiological and neurocognitive mechanisms underlying yoga. And this one here, Potential Self-Regulatory Mechanisms of Yoga for Psychological Health. So I want to share a little bit about that kind of knowledge with you to give you a sense of where we are in the field. But first of all, let's go back historically a little bit. Um, and one of the things that was appearing in the Western media back in the 1800s when the British were, were ruling India and people who were traveling to India to see this, this strange country was the reports that there were these people, these yogis or fakirs, some of them were called, that could do these fantastic things with their minds and their bodies. So things like being buried in a pit underground for days or lying on a bed of nails. And another claim was that they could stop their heartbeats. And some of these reports came into the Western media, and some of these scientists in the West picked this up and said, hmm, that's interesting. You can stop your heartbeat. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see if there's some, something going on there that's worthy of scientific investigation. And so here we have um, a woman named Therese Brose, who was a French woman who actually was a fellow, a research fellow at Harvard Medical School in the 1930s. And she took, cardi uh, she took electrocardiographic recording equipment that could measure the heartbeat and took that to India and hooked up people who were advanced yoga practitioners and s tried to see if they could indeed stop their hearts. Now, it's equivocal whether she was actually able to see them stop their hearts because if you stop your hearts, you're going to pass out no matter who you are. But she was able to show that these yogis could slow their heart rates down. And actually, that's been observed recently in, in, in a current study in India that was done just a couple of years ago, that yogis have control of the autonomic nervous system to the degree that they can slow their heart rate down. Now, you have to understand this in the context of modern medicine, certainly in the 30s. This is completely unknown. Um, the autonomic nervous system was called that because it was automatic. In other words, you had no control over it. It just did what it did, and you had to put up with it. And here were these yogis showing that they could control this system. Now, as we know, the autonomic nervous system is one of the major components of the stress system. So as it turns out, this whole construct uh, is what we call self-regulation, the ability to control your internal state by yourself. Now, uh, perhaps the most comprehensive study of this kind was conducted by two Indian researchers who had faculty positions at the University of Michigan uh, and UCLA in Los Angeles. And they took this portable recording equipment you see in this photograph here to India. And they spent a year traveling all over India searching for all of these yoga masters wherever they could find them. And they hooked them up to, this, to these uh, recorders and, and studied what was happening with them. 
So here's these two researchers, one here and one here, and here's your yogi with the electrodes taped to his forehead with a smile on his face. And they uh, did all these recordings and that at the end of this, they published this study, and at the end of the study they concluded that physiologically yogic meditation represents deep relaxation of the autonomic nervous system. So there's additional proof and verification that indeed the practice of yoga allows you to control your internal state, particularly the stress systems. Now, perhaps one of the most remarkable anecdotes of this kind of self-regulation was by another one of these yoga masters of many that came to the U.S. from India. This was Swami Rama. And they uh, hooked him up at the Menninger Clinic. And um, one of the things they did was to hook up an electrocardiogram to him to measure his heartbeat. And just by sitting in a chair without doing anything overt, he was able to drive his heart into atrial flutter which is not a healthful thing to do, basically stops your heart. Um, and he was able to do this at will, showing that indeed he could control his, his, his heart rate to the degree that he could even shut it down. And this bottom left panel here, what they did was they put temperature sensors on both sides of the same hand, okay? And they're measuring skin temperature. And just by sitting there, not doing anything really overt, he was able to increase the temperature on one side of the hand while simultaneously decreasing the temperature on the other side of the same hand. Now, this isn't paranormal or ESP or anything like that. What he's doing is controlling skin temperature. And skin temperature is regulated by the innervation, the nervous innervation of the blood vessels to the skin. So the more blood you have, the warmer it is, the less blood to the skin, um, the colder it is. And that's controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So not only was he able to control the autonomic nervous system, he was able to distinguish between the autonomic nerves that innervate the left and right hand sides of the hand. Now, I, I like this anecdote because what it really emphasizes is the enormous capability that humans have of controlling their internal state. And this is important because modern medicine is completely clueless about this. Um, it's starting to be recognized in the field of mind-body medicine and integrative medicine, which is becoming more popular. But in general, modern medicine is really the doctor treats you and you have no control. Whereas in fact, if you did these behavioral practices, these mind-body practices, whether it's yoga or tai chi or qigong, you would end up with the ability to control your internal state. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the progress of your body's imbalance in terms of coming into a disease state. So skipping forward now to modern um, medicine, we have several techniques that are really revolutionizing what we can learn and understand about yoga and contemplative practices. And one of these techniques is called neuroimaging. And this technique usually has these l huge func uh, machines that you actually are put into. And these brain imaging machines can look into the brain and see changes from second to second and also be very precise about which area of the brain is being activated, which nucleus in the brain. And that can tell you what areas of the brain are being involved in these practices. So this is, this is one of the many studies that's come out. It's an older one. Um, but what it showed is that there's a very different brain activation pattern in meditators as compared with non-meditators. And not surprisingly, the areas of the brain that are activated in meditators are those areas of the brain that are related to the behavioral changes that we see as a consequence of meditation practice. So um, the prefrontal cortex, that's the executive brain, and it works on the observed changes appear in structure that underlie the attention network and those that relate to emotion and autonomic function. And so the attention networks are the attention networks that you're engaging when you're focusing your attention in meditation. And of course, when you do that, we know that there's, there's connections between the frontal lobe, the executive brain, and the emotional brain, or the limbic system. In fact, they're inhibitory connections. So the more you focus your meditation, focus on meditation and activate the attention networks, the more you inhibit the emotional brain. And so you end up with emotion regulation improvements and, and, and autonomic function improvements. So this is where we're starting to see this now neurophysiologically, what the brain connections are that, that occur during the aspect of meditation. Now, the brain 
exhibits a phenomenon called plasticity. And what that means is that the brain can change. It can change in its structure. The neurons can make more connections. There can be more blood flow to different regions of the brain. And in fact, the more you engage in certain types of activity, the brain accommodates that by devoting more resources and therefore more structure to the areas of the brain that are involved in that activity. And the same is true for meditation and yoga practice. So this is a study that was done at the National Institutes of Health in the United States, which, are, which is our premier um, uh, government agency for research. And this study looked at long-term yoga practitioners and compared them with normal subjects. And what they found was that yoga practitioners in the dark dots here had higher levels of cold pain tolerance than people that did not practice yoga at all. In other words, for some reason, Yogis can tolerate pain better than people that don't practice yoga. But not only that, but those areas of the brain that are involved in pain regulation were larger in the yoga practitioners. So there were structural changes. Not only was their activity in terms of pain better, they had larger structure, brain structure. So when you practice yoga over the long term, you actually end up with a yoga brain. It's actually changed in both structure and function. And this graph on the right really sort of documents that because this is the number of years of yoga practice correlated with the thickness of those areas of the brain. The longer you've practiced yoga, the more that structure and that uh, behavior has taken hold. And that's not surprising because the more you do something, the better you get at it. And that's actually refre reflected in the brain. Another phenomenon um, is the effect of age on, on our brain. And we know that a lot of our cognitive faculties and functions actually deteriorate with aging. Um, and one of these areas is, one of these uh, functions is called fluid intelligence. And fluid intelligence is a high level cognitive activity. It's what really makes us and distinguishes us as human beings. Um, it's the ability to think abstractly, to reason, identify patterns, solve problems, and discern relationships. So it's a really a high level executive function. And we know that with aging, that declines. So here on the, on the lower axis, you can see age going up. And this is fluid intelligence on the vertical axis. And this is the solid line representing what happens to normal people, to the average general public. We get a decline in fluid intelligence with aging. This study compared those normal subjects with long-term meditators and long-term yoga practitioners. And their traces are in the dashed and, da uh, dashed, uh, dashed and dotted lines here. So really what's happening is that yoga is actually keeping your brain youthful. It's keeping it from decaying from the, f from the effects of aging. Um, and this is also not, this is not just behavioral, but this study particularly looked at the functional architecture um, of the network properties that are involved in fluid intelligence, showing that those physical network properties were actually maintained better with yoga and meditation practice. So yoga keeps you, your, keeps your brain essentially younger with, with, with practice. This cartoon reads, meditation isn't what you think. And of course, that's true. That's what meditation is. Meditation is the focus of attention. And when you're not focusing your attention, your mind is wandering. So you're either focusing your attention or your mind is wandering. Now, for people who don't practice meditation, their mind is generally wandering quite a bit. Now, this whole feature of mind wandering in contradistinction to meditation has now actually become a field of science, a field of research. Now, this whole construct of mind wandering is not new. And of course, the construct of meditation is not new. But there, so going back historically, the first documentation of, that I'm aware of that describes the act of meditation and mind wandering in, at the same time are the Upanishads. Um, so here's a quote from one Upanishad. This mind of mine is extremely restless. The mind wanders among objects as a monkey does from tree to tree. And that, of course, is just as true then as it is now. Um, mind wandering is what people do. You're standing at the bus stop and your mind is going on and on and on about all kinds of stuff in the past and in the future. And this Upanishad says, the man who has a discriminating intellect as his driver and a controlled mind as the reins reaches the end of that path, the supreme state of Vishnu. 
The suggestion here is that controlling the tension, reining in the flow of thought to a single point, and controlling that focus leads to positive benefits. And so that is the goal of meditation. That's the practice of meditation. What we do in meditation is we bring back our focus to the target, whether that's a mantra, whether that's uh, the breath, whether it's the body, whether it's the flow of thought in mindfulness meditation, whatever. We are focusing attention, and that is the key player uh, in meditation practice. And surprisingly, as I've mentioned, modern science is now starting to study mind wandering. So this is actually a paper that was published in our premier biomedical journal, uh, science, and this was a Harvard study, and what they found in this study is that people's minds wander frequently, regardless of what they are doing. Furthermore, people are less happy when their minds are wandering than when they're not wandering. So that's interesting. Why would mind wandering, allowing your mind to wander, make you less happy? And I think the answer is in the nature of survival and the nature of the mind. The reason that we're a successful species is that we can analyze the past and predict the future. And what we do to, to achieve that is that we spend time analyzing and predicting and judging. And so as you're standing at that bus stop, what are you thinking about? You're not thinking about how wonderful life is, how nice it is to hear the birds. You may be from time to time, but for most of the time what you're thinking about is what, is, what if the bus is late? Uh, what's my boss going to say when I arrive late? And how am I going to manage that? And is it going to rain? And I didn't bring an umbrella. And geez, that fight with my spouse this morning didn't go that well. How am I going to rep how am I going to fix that? And on and on and on. And one thought leads to the next, and it's an endless chain of stressful type thoughts because we are doing what we are as animals. Our primary goal is is survival, and so this processing of thinking about the future and the past and analyzing it and judging it is all part of our um, coping with and surviving. So a lot of these thoughts are stressful in nature. They're negative mood content. So as a consequence, what's happening? Every time you have one of these thoughts, oh, oh my God, the bus is going to be late, you generate a little stress response. And as you do that consistently over time, as, a, as the water drops, you know, one drop at a time on a rock after a thousand years, there's a bowl. Same thing happens in the brain. You actually support that stress response. You have now a very nice, strong stress and emotional response because you're feeding it every day with mind wandering. So what does meditation do? Well, meditation is essentially a mind wandering holiday. You go into a neutral space. You stop the mind wandering process for however long that you're meditating. And that's now sort of the, the subject of, of active research. And so this is a really nice research uh, study that I'd like to describe. This is by Wendy Hassenkamp, um, a mindfulness meditation researcher. And what she did was she brought meditators into the brain scanner. And the instruction was, okay, meditate. And as you know, what happens during meditation is you start out with great intentions. You focus your attention on the breath or a mantra, whatever. And then suddenly 30 or 40 seconds later, you're thinking about something else and your mind is wandering and then you catch yourself and you say oops I better go back and focus attention and that happens round and round and round and round that is what meditation is it's the constant bringing your focus back to the point of attention and so what she did in this study is that she gave the um, subjects in the study an event marker put to push a button and the instruction was whenever you've noticed when you first noticed that your mind is wandering after you've been focusing your attention, press the button. So now she's able to look at the brain scans for when they were meditating and when their mind was wandering, and she can compare those. So in the focus phase, when they were in meditation and they were actively holding their attention, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the frontal lobe was being activated. This is the executive brain. This is the attention networks in the brain, not surprisingly. However, when the mind was wandering, the so-called default mode network was being activated. And the default mode network is basically the network of areas in the brain that are interacting when your mind is wandering. And so what we're starting to see is the physiology of what, what, what happens when we're either in the attention networks in meditation or we're in the default mode network in mind wandering. And what we're starting to find is that long-term devotion to, the, to mind wandering, spending all of your time and life in mind wandering, 
is a risk factor for developing a mood disorder. And in fact, the opposite is true for people who meditate. In fact, for people, long-term meditators, what they're finding is that the limbic system, the amygdala in the limbic system, which is the emotional brain, actually gets smaller because they're spending more time in the attention phase and not as much time triggering the limbic system, triggering, triggering the emotion system. So this is essentially what we're seeing now is mechanistically how we are becoming less stress reactive and less emotionally reactive as we practice meditation more and more. So this is really remarkable and these studies are really at the cutting edge and, and, and they're just growing more and more and more. There's a lot of studies being proposed. A lot of the studies that are being done in meditation and yoga are using uh, these brain imaging techniques. So this is, we're just at the, at the beginning of this process and so we're going to be learning a lot in this direction. Now there's another area of research which is really r much more recent and there's much less research on it but it's really an exciting area. And this is a, an area of research that uses molecular biological techniques to look at what's happening at the cellular level with the molecules in our cells. And specifically, we're looking at the genes, our DNA. Now, we can't change our DNA. That's it. We've inherited that DNA, and we're stuck with that. But the thing about genes is that they can be active or they can be inactive. And there's a whole set of processes in the body that are responsible for turning genes on and turning them off. So in fact, if you're turning on cancer genes by smoking cigarettes, you're going to end up potentially with cancer. That's a risk factor for cancer. You're turning on genes that may, may end up uh, producing cancer. So now the same is true with positive behaviors. So what this study did, this is a Herbert Benson's group who's been a longtime uh, meditation researcher did a few years ago. They took blood samples before and after eight weeks of yoga and meditation type practices. And what they found was that genomic expression or the expression of the gene activity was changed in those people that practice these contemplative practices. And the areas of the, the genes that were affected were essentially the good genes were upregulated and the bad genes were downregulated. And so here they're talking about um, energy metabolism, mitochondrial function, insulin secretion, which is involved in glucose regulation, telomere maintenance, and reduced expression of genes linked to inflammatory response and stress-related pathways. So these genes that were being downregulated were the genes involved in the stress response and in inflammation. So this is really positive stuff. Now we're seeing that yoga not only has positive benefits, but it works down at the cellular level. So altogether, the, these molecular biological studies and the brain imaging studies are telling us something very important. They're telling us that these yoga and meditation practices are not just a hobby. It's not just a new agey thing. This is real biology. This is truly measurable and profound. And it's not surprising to those of us who've been practicing for 30, 40 years because we've experienced those, those, those positive changes in our lives. But for the general public and other scientists in modern medicine, this kind of these kinds of objective measures are really moving us forward in, in a very strong way. So I wanted to touch on another aspect of yoga practices which has not received much research, but which I think has enormous impact. And this ties, this goes back to the original historical goals of these contemplative practices, which were to achieve enlightenment, to achieve these deeper states of consciousness, to achieve nirvana, um, uh, to, to, to achieve this oceanic, unitive flow state of consciousness. And we know that this happens with our yoga students. I mean, our yoga students will come back after a month and they'll say, you know, this has profoundly changed my life. And I've heard so many times people will come up to me who've been just practicing yoga maybe for the first year and they'll say, you know, yoga changed my life. It's actually a profound change. And I think it's possible to measure this, maybe not yet with brain imaging techniques, but certainly with questionnaires. And I wanted to share with you a little bit of the evidence that we have on that. We did a survey, an internet survey, on long-term yoga practitioners. And we asked questions about things like positive psychological attitudes and transcendence and mental mastery. And we also collected information on, on how much they practice yoga and how long they've been practicing yoga. And it was clear that both of those were related 
to the experience of transcendence and mental mastery. In other words, the longer they'd practice, the more they'd practice, the more they had these transcendent type experiences. And one study that, that's really nice, this was actually a study of ashram members, this uh, Kripalu Yoga Ashram study, uh, conducted quite some time ago. But what they did was they compared the ashram members with members of the general public. And they asked them specific questions about certain types of life experiences and found out how many of the ashram uh, uh, members had experienced that compared to how many of the general public had experienced that. And so you can see here, um, this is um, becoming uh, more aware of bodily sensations. 87% of, of the ashram members, 42% of the general public um, felt a personality change. 90% of the ashram residents, only 50% of the non-ashram residents. Um, experience resulted in a change in life, 87% versus 64%. And then down to the real meat of this, experience of oneness, 83% versus 40%. And then finally, in touch with the divine or spiritual, 91% versus 43%. So clearly, these ashram residents are actually experiencing some of these transcendent states. Um, and so I've, I'm really fascinated with this particular topic because this is actually the reason I went into yoga research in the first place. The problem is there's no funding for this, so I ended up studying other things like clinical trials of, of yoga therapy. But this is really a, a, a profound uh, finding and I think has enormous impact for, for health and for, for wellness in the general public. And one opportunity that I did have to study this was in a study that we did at the Kripalu Yoga Center in Massachusetts. And the Kripalu Yoga Center sits right across the street from the Tanglewood Music Center, which is a very famous um, music center in Massachusetts and, and known internationally. And what they do is they have a summer program for very high-level elite young musicians. And these young musicians come to this center and they stay for eight weeks and go through a very intense music program. And what we did was we had an arrangement with them that we would teach yoga to these young musicians. And one thing that we measured was this state of flow. There's now a questionnaire that measures the flow state. And the flow state is this state when you're in an activity, you're completely absorbed in that activity. There's no mind wandering. There's a sense of joy. There's a sense of peace. There's a sense of, um, there's no distinction between you and the activity. You're in this flow state. You're in the zone as a lot of sports performers will say. And that questionnaire showed that after six weeks of yoga practice, the group that practiced yoga had an increase in the total flow score, whereas the control group had no change. And a subscale of this questionnaire is called autotelic experience, which is nothing else except this unitive state of consciousness, this sense of unitive oceanic experience. And we had an increase in the yoga group, and if anything, the, the control group might have got a little worse, but that was no change. So clearly, yoga can, even over the short term, increase this, this sense of spirituality. Now, this, this change is probably not occurring in terms of an overt five-hour mystical experience. What's probably happening is that just for a second during Shavasana, you experience this deep sense of peace and harmony and flow. And that can be very profound. And if they're experiencing it in their music performance, that's where they can experience this flow state. So um, these are sort of the key areas that I've described that I think yoga has potential benefit. And I like to summarize this in a what we call a logic model. So here's what, what I'm defining as yoga is not just postures, but also the pranayama, um, relaxation, sirvasana, and most importantly, meditation techniques. Of course, we know that the, the pranayama and the postures increase our physical fitness, flexibility, strength, um, uh, coordination, balance, respiratory function, and physical self-efficacy, control of our, uh, ourselves. Self-regulation I've talked about, that's both emotion and stress regulation, which leads to an improvement in resilience and equanimity in the face of strong emotions, which is a psychological self-efficacy. The meditation component, we're constantly holding these attention networks, we're paying attention to our body, we're paying attention to our mind, and we're increasing mind-body awareness. Through the attention networks, we're increasing our mindfulness, our concentration, our cognition, and what we call metacognition. 
And this is this idea of being able to watch your emotions and your, and your thoughts without getting caught up in them. Um, and that is a key, a key factor in terms of developing this mind-body awareness. And then finally, the last thing I've mentioned, there is a spirituality component when you practice yoga long enough and intensively enough. You get this experience of transcendence, a unitive state, a flow state. That leads to a life transformation. And that transformation can be really profound because it will change people's life meaning and purpose um, and gravitate and get them to gravitate towards these positive behaviors in life. Um, to change their goals from, you know, earning the biggest house on the block with the greatest number of cars and getting out of the rat race and focusing on um, human activities that really do provide the most happiness and, and, and the best outcome for, for human behavior. So ultimately, these states and these skills lead to an increase in global human functionality, whether that's physical and mental health or uh, performance or behavior change, uh, social interactions, relationships, and ultimately quality of life, life purpose and meaning, and even spirituality. So this is how we can really see how global the effects of these yoga practices are and how powerful they are. And I want to just end very, very quickly and briefly just to show you that indeed the research that's being done on yoga for a variety of populations is indeed showing improvements in stress. And this is a survey study we did in Austin, Texas with a group of yoga studios. They have a beginner's yoga program, and there are hundreds of people going through those programs. We studied them and asked them, why are you going to a yoga program? One of the biggest reasons, stress management. And this is, of course, a lot of this is through word of mouth. People go to yoga class, they improve their stress, they talk to their friend who's in a chronic stress, and suddenly everybody's doing it because of the chronic stress. Not only that, but we measured the stress of these individuals before and after the yoga program and indeed we got statistically significant reductions in perceived stress and this is now really there's a lot of studies now showing that in fact yoga can can positively impact stress um, and this is one of the several reviews that's out there yoga is an alternative and complementary approach for stress management a systematic review um, definitely showing that that most studies are showing positive results on yoga for stress and as I've mentioned, we've been doing some of this work ourselves. This was a study of Krupalu Yoga in police academy cadets in, um, in Massachusetts. And of course, first responders like policemen and, and firefighters are under chronic stress all the time. So um, this is a population that would really benefit from this. And, and these cadets were able to improve their perce perceived stress. And that goes hand in hand with mood disturbance, tension, and fatigue it, all being improved at the same time. Um, one of the things that's come up here is that a lot of my research has over the past 10 years been focused on yoga in the public schools because I strongly believe that the greatest marriage of yoga research and mind-body medicine research is the marriage with preventive medicine. Um, we need to be giving these practices to our kids, not waiting till they have heart disease when they're 50 to give them yoga practices, but giving it to them when they're 13 so that they can not get heart disease. That makes a lot of sense to me. So we've been focusing on yoga in the public schools, um, and there is a huge burden of mental health disorders and mental health challenges in our adolescents and schools. All you have to do is ask any principal, and they'll tell you that it's just a huge burden. And they have no answer to it. And yoga is an answer. So what we've been doing is, is uh, doing studies of yoga in schools, and here's some of the results. Um, this was a randomized controlled trial. The yoga group here did sh showed no change in perceived stress over the course of a single semester. But look what happened to the control group that did not practice yoga. They got worse because adolescents are not functionally coping with the stress in their lives. And the strategies we gave them were allowing them to cope with stress and maintain their stress at reasonable levels. So yoga is acting as preventive medicine. And that's true in resilience as well. So yoga actually improved resilience a little bit, but the control subjects got worse in their resilience to stress. So this is, this is a critical area um, that, that we're really hopeful for in terms of trying to um, give these young people skills that they can take for the rest of their lives. Um, we're also doing this in, 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 in business settings, in workplace settings. These are results of my friend Ned Hartfield, who works in the UK, uh, studying clerical workers in the, in the workplace. 
And in a randomized controlled trial of yoga, they showed statistically significant improvements in life purpose and satisfaction and self-confidence during stress after eight weeks of yoga compared to those that didn't practice yoga. And I want to end with quotes from the children that we're studying in the schools. Uh, we do qualitative interviews with these schools and we ask the children what they're, what they're experiencing and are they using these practices. So here's one student that said, before you're taking a test, relax and breathe and you don't get as nervous or as tense. So here's something they took immediately from the yoga class and immediately started applying it right away into their lives. Um, slow breathing, very powerful technique to reduce um, the stress response. Another student said, I use breathing outside the classroom in my life to calm me down. If I was stressed or angry, I would then do the breathing to calm me down, and I will probably continue to do this. I was less anxious about school in general. So they've learned this technique. Now it's, it's free. They, can, they don't have to take drugs to reduce their stress. They have pranayama, and this is there for the rest of their lives. Um, and then the third student said, yoga definitely helped with sleeping. It would take me a long time to get to sleep. When I was doing yoga, it was much easier to fall asleep and stay asleep. And sleep, what is sleep? Sleep is all about psychophysiological arousal. If your stress system is activated, if your stress hormones are high, your tension is high, you're going to have difficulty falling asleep. And what yoga does is reduce that stress response to allow you to sleep more effectively. And that's one of the most common anecdotes you get from beginner yoga students. You know, I started to notice that my sleep improved. That's directly a function of the improvement in your stress regulation. And so I'm going to leave you with my favorite yoga stress cartoon. Okay, your posture is very good. Now relax, concentrate, and slowly let go of your cell phone. Thanks for your attention. Um, um, very great uh, talk, really inspirational. I had a question. It seems it's so, I mean, for us, obviously, so obvious that this is such a benefit and so, so good. I'm curious what's preventing, um, in your opinion, like the greater society at large to adopt these, especially for schools or in, in other areas. Is it like the pharmaceutical companies trying to just pump people full of drugs, or is it, um, you know, like, is there like what? threshold in research do we have to pass mm -hmm. that this gets accepted in the mainstream yeah. and we just go? Well, the pharmaceutical companies are trying to pump drugs into society and use that as the solution for all of the problems. Um, but that doesn't, in, that doesn't impact yoga one way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the key here is what it takes to change um, policy and science. And it takes a long time. Um, because you have to have what we call in science is a critical mass of research studies. And that's where you reach the point where there's so many studies done with so many different laboratories and so many different populations that the results are absolutely unequivocally clear that this does what these studies say it does. And just to give you some examples without having to go back to Copernicus, um, how long did it take for research to show that smoking is not good for you and we should stop smoking. You know, it's been 50, 60 years of research until now the policy is finally in place where you can't smoke in restaurants or in campuses, et cetera, et cetera. So it takes quite a bit of while, uh, quite a while for the policy to follow the research and I think the same is true here. However, the one thing that we have in our favor here as well as th that critical mass being reached is that the general public is voting with their feet the most recent survey in the United States done by the Yoga Journal and the Yoga Alliance showed that 36 million Americans are currently practicing yoga. And for those of the people that are not practicing yoga, in answer to the question, do you have some interest in practicing yoga, 80 million. So not only is it already very popular in the public, but that popularity is growing. And when you look at the chart of you know, what it does from year to year, it's, it's not just linear, it's exponential, which means that it's like rocketing up there. So, so that is starting to make a difference as well because the public is already kind of practicing it. Yeah, two questions. One, is there research on specific efficacy of different techniques on meditation? And two, where is the research conflicting or where does it need to go next to answer some of the unresolved questions? Great questions. So the first one is that, that, you know, at this point in time in the field of yoga and meditation research, the question we are asking in our scientific studies is, 
Does yoga do anything at all? That's, that's where we're at. <laughs> um, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked after that question has an unequivocal yes. And those questions are, how much do you have to practice to get how much benefit? How much do you have to practice to get improvement in your type 2 diabetes? Um, and we don't know questions on dose and how much you need to practice, nor do we know what kind of practices are best. Do you want to do more asana or do you want to do more pranayama? Um, and there's also the, the question of which style of yoga or which style of meditation is better. And we're not there yet where we're comparing Bikram yoga with Kripalu yoga yet. It's not happening. It, you know, there's no money for that at this point in time. There have been just a handful of studies, and by a handful I mean like less than six studies that have compared different forms of meditation. One that I can think of has compared the Buddhist forms of meditation of mindfulness with metta meditation or loving kindness meditation, which are two very distinctly different forms of meditation. One is actually more of a form of guided imagery, and the other one is you know, focusing, on, uh, focusing the attention on the flow of thought. And those show different effects on brain activity, not surprisingly. And I think what the future will show is that indeed, different styles of yoga, different styles of meditation produce different effects. It's not like yoga is just one thing and meditation is just one thing. There's a whole world of the differences that we can see. And ultimately, that field of research is going to grow. And I think what's going to happen is that ultimately, 100 years from now, you're going to get a prescription for your imbalance in your body and it's going to be a specific type of meditation and a specific type of yoga practice and you'll get a prescription to do that type of practice because we know that this affects that and this affects that but that's that's way into the future in terms of the conflicting evidence um, there's not much that's that's really conflicting the problem is that this is a brand new field and whenever you enter a brand new field you go through a learning process and, and we're experiencing that in yoga in schools. Like some of the studies, we do a year-long study of yoga in a school and we show no change whatsoever. Now, we know the kids are improving, but the problem is that working in a school setting is challenging. There's a lot of factors that you're dealing with. So if you haven't worked with the school staff to convince them that yoga is positive, then what's happening during the yoga class is the teacher's standing on the side poo-pooing it, and the kids are looking at the teacher and saying, oh, this isn't worthwhile, so they're not putting effort into it. That's one example of where a study could come out with a negative result. The questionnaires that we use for kids to evaluate changes in yoga are far and few between, and they may not measure the best things that yoga is doing. So the questionnaires, the instruments you're using may not be the right instruments. So there's a whole learning curve that happens with any brand new field, and we're, stu we're stubbing our toes and we're learning by our mistakes and slowly trying to get our instruments refined so that we can really measure these changes. So that's where we're at in the field of yoga research. We're, you know, it's a brand new infant field, and we're starting to, to make progress, but it's, it's slow. Well, thanks very much for your attention again. <laughs>